Hello and welcome to the very first How I Print Things. Now this is going to serve as an episode zero, kind of a very basics video, because when I got started I went through four or five different sources of information and I found it really interesting. The research to me is one of the best bits of a new hobby and that is one way to look at it I really think with these machines. Don't come into it expecting that you're just going to print toys off the thing straight away. It is a hobby in and of itself, and that means learning techniques, getting to understand your tools, and all that sort of fun stuff. So I thought it would be interesting to cover some of the technology first, because an understanding of how the machine actually operates is going to help you get the best out of your FDM printer. So I've got a couple of diagrams and some examples with me. Let's crack into the science. This is going to be a fairly dry episode, but you might find it interesting. Pop me on in the background somewhere. Now you'll see straight away that my skill is with the brush and not really the pen. <laughs> I'm hoping you can forgive me that. What I've got here is a quick diagram of the Ender 3, which is the machine that I've got, but the same principles hold true for most FDM machines. Now there are two main kinds of home 3D printing. That's FDM and SLA. Now FDM stands for Fused Deposition Modeling. And what that means is as this little hot bit with the nozzle moves backwards and forwards, it is squirting out a layer of hot plastic. It is depositing each layer, which then fuses with the layer underneath it and builds our model, fused deposition modeling. Simple. SLA stands for stereolithography, and that is a resin method where the build plate is actually rising out of the pile of goo, and there's UV light being fired into it to actually cure and fuse that resin and make the miniature. It's really interesting. There is a little more cleanup involved with a resin printing and it can be a little unpleasant. Some of the chemicals are actually toxic. So this is why I chose to start with FDM. If you're taking the right precautions, of course, you don't have to worry too much about it. It is designed for home use, but instead of SLA, we're going to concentrate on our FDM, our fused deposition modeling, like the Ender 3, uh, or any of the others that you might find out there. So what is all of this? There's really a few interesting bits that you need to know about. Now, first things first, this part here, this is the extruder, or sometimes called the hot end. This is where the filament, the PLA, which is poly, poly, I haven't written that bit down, PLA filament, it's a plastic. It is fed into the top of this extruder, and sometimes there's a little plastic tube around it to help that feed uh, securely. It then gets heated up, normally between about 190 to 220 degrees Celsius, and then pff, out it comes, out the nozzle. That's real simple. It's actually, the technology in this is actually incredibly simple, and I want to talk about that too. The plate here, sorry, the bar here, moves up and down on this one. So the extruder, the hot end moves backwards and forwards and up and down on an Ender 3 machine. Some, it also moves backwards and forwards on the other, the other plane, uh, but this one doesn't. This moves in two directions, and then the actual build plate itself moves backwards and forwards, giving you all three planes of movement. Now, it's important that you recognize this machine is dumb. And I mean dumb in the sense that it has no live understanding of where it is. It needs to count where it's gone. So on each of the little uh, axes, it has a little clicker, which I've very badly drawn in here. So to start off a print, it will move along until it hits the edge of the bar here, and it will set off this clicker, and it knows where it is. Then it will move down, and it will set off, click that next machine there, and then it knows where it is. And then the build plate will move back to its home position, click, it knows where it is. From then on, it only knows where it is by counting where it's been. So it understands from the home position, I have moved three centimeters up, nine centimeters long, and the build plate has moved eight centimeters in the other direction. It doesn't understand where it is at any point, and that's important for troubleshooting later. But I just think that's cool. It is such a, a primitive machine, really, that does all of this cool stuff. Now, talking about the build plate, the Ender 3 comes with a heated plate, which I have found really useful. So I've got this 
little thin black line underneath, which is the heat plate, and then on top of that sits the actual build plate. Now, this little diagram here, this is top down, the heat plate has these little screws and dialing knobs, adjuster knobs, where you can adjust the four corners and make sure that your bed is level when the um, head is moving around on it. This is important because obviously it needs to be flat. It doesn't understand whether or not it's flat. It can't calibrate that for you. There are you know, add-ons that you can build or add to it yourself that will automatically level the bed, but you're going to want to do this manually the first time so that you get, you get the gist of how that works. And simply you're screwing these uh, knobs up and down. There's a spring underneath them which adjusts how the bed sits on the heat plate, and away you go. Then to start off with, my happy little LCD screen here, <laughs> you tell the heat bed to heat up, it then warms up, and the important thing for this, the heat really helps it stick. When you're printing hot plastic, it needs something to stick to so that that plastic layer you've laid down stays flat and doesn't move, because if it moves, our machine head here, it doesn't know what's up, okay? That's pretty much the ins and outs of the mechanical side of things. It's remarkably simple when you really see how it goes together. Now the Ender 3 I purchased came as a kit where I had to actually assemble the bars themselves and then bolt the components on and plug the machine together. So all of the wires and cables and what have you, they came disassembled. It seems daunting. Uh, when I... <laughs> When I opened the kit, I had a right grumble, but it's not that difficult. All you need to be is confident with a screwdriver. You don't need any prior uh, experience, just as long as you know what you're doing when you've got a screwdriver in your hand, you'll be safe. Remember, righty-tighty, lefty-loosey, that's all. <laughs> oh, I'll be waiting for an excuse to say that one. Right, so that's the machine itself. Let's crack on and we'll talk about the software that you're going to use. So the most important piece of software for controlling your 3D printer is what's called a slicer. Now, slicing refers to taking any three-dimensional object and slicing it into layers so that the printer understands how to build those up. Now, sometimes you'll get a print which prints in one direction. You know, you put, for example, one of these Saga dice, this prints with one face on the ground and it just <laughs> builds up very simply. This Churchill kit, on the other hand, this actually prints in multiple pieces and it's designed so that you see here the join in the center. This one prints facing upright, but then the, uh, the tracks rather actually print on their sides so that the outward facing part is gonna be a smooth top layer because with 3D printing, with FDM machines, you're always gonna get that slight layer line. So for example, papyrus over here, if I, you see, you can hear that, uh, that texture. Now you can mitigate that and you can do a lot of that with your slicing software. I use Cura because it's really user friendly and it was recommended to me. It's also free and I like free. <laughs> uh, you can also use, there are others out there and I suggest a quick Google. Okay, you'll find what you need without much fuss. Now this is Sergeant Ballyhoo, and again I remind you of my skill with a brush, please don't judge me too much on this. He's here to help me demonstrate what supports are. When you're printing in three dimensions, obviously we start at the bottom and our printer <laughs> is doing this, all right? It's squirting out layers of hot plastic that are laying on top of one another, and away we go. We start layering up as we go, and along comes Sergeant Ballyhoo until we get to a, an overhang, let's say. Now what happens is our extruder head comes along and it's got all this hot plastic and it's dumb. It doesn't know what is top, bottom, anything like that. All it knows is that when it reaches this position, it is going to squirt some plastic. So if there's no support under here, you've got this big overhang, what happens is it squirts plastic and you get spaghetti. All right. It doesn't understand that there should be something there. You need to tell it that. Now, Cura is really useful for this because it automatically generates supports. And a support is just a really thin structure which builds up from the base plate and all the way up until the point when it reaches where the actual thing is going to print. Now, supports can be printed in a variety of ways. They can be very thick, 
they can be very thin. In Cura, you can set the distance between the actual uh, support layer and the item itself. So you can have them permanently joined, which you then have to clip off, kind of like you would with an ordinary model kit. But supports are important. I know that a lot of people don't like printing with supports, and they will deliberately slice up a miniature into several pieces so that it lays flat on the print bed and they can print it without any supports. I don't know. I've not had any issues really with using supports. It just takes a little bit of practice knowing where the best uh, sort of orientation to print from is. So for example, this is what you're going to get when it comes off the machine. And, uh, hmm, <laughs> looks a bit nonsense, doesn't it? This is with supports added. And this is one of the Hero Forge miniatures. Uh, actually, this is Manny here. Uh, I painted one yesterday, and then I've printed another for you guys to get a look at today. And if we just fiddle with the lighting there a little bit, you can see much clearer how that works. So, for example, his arm's outstretched, he's got a pistol there, and the machine has printed out a single, thin sort of structure for that arm to rest on when it prints off. So, what do you do? You have to clip those off. But luckily, that's not as difficult as it sounds. With an ordinary pair of just side cutters, if you happen to have these, you know, laying around, you make miniatures. If you're here, you probably do already. Sometimes, you can even just pull away the supports. Tend to be a little bit more careful when you get near areas of detail, but if I just give a quick... You know what, I'm not going to be cocky and try and pull that off. But all it is, is just crunching up the supports, and you'll start to see they do very quickly split and then you can start cleaning them up. So, let's have a quick look. See, look, that's, <laughs> that is so easy. Um, I could even set it so that this was easier to peel away, but I wanted the miniature to be safe as it was printing. So, let's come back to this in a minute, and I'll show you what he looks like with all the supports peeled off. And there he is. After about five, six minutes of work, I've managed to pull away all of the supports, and I'm going to have to get a different color of uh, of PLA, because I can't get the camera to quite pick this up. But there you have it. I mean, it is fairly simple, guys. And again, there is a painted example, which many here has had no filling, no filing. From this to this, all I took was a little bit of knife work, because you want to clean off some of the little remaining stringy bits, same as you would as if you were preparing a plastic miniature. Then I gave him an automotive primer and painted over the top of that quite happily. You would struggle to see the layer lines unless you were looking for them. So I'm pretty impressed with how this little machine turned out. So on the subject of layer lines, that's where you're going to get that faint texture. You'll see I've sanded on a couple of these. It's always going to be a problem with FDM miniatures because of the fact... There we go, that's better. That is how FDM works, printing in layers but you can change with your slicer how thick those layers are. By using a finer nozzle, you can go to even smaller layers until you're printing at 0 0.02 millimeters a layer. It's pretty bonkers. Now this fella here, I printed at 0 0.08 millimeters. So you can get pretty good. You know, <laughs> Even with a stock machine, the results I think are worthwhile. Are you ever going to print out an entire army of miniatures with this thing? Well, no, that's not really what I'm aiming for personally. But as far as getting those one-offs, you know, the miniatures that you can't find anywhere else, or which, you know, the stag hounds here, for example, I've never found a plastic kit in 156 scale of the stag hound Mark I, so I printed one. It's going to change how you deal with your vehicles and scenery, I think. But miniatures are definitely viable as well. If you're a D&D player, if your DM drops down, you know, something like this every couple of weeks for your new bunch of bad guys, how cool is that? Now I'm going to drop a link down in the description to the slicer settings that I used for Cura. They actually come courtesy of Danny, the 3D printing DM, who I will also link to down there. Uh, his videos were really helpful in getting started. As well, uh, Chuck over at Chip, <laughs> Chuck at Chip, yep, it, it throws me too. He does a series of videos called Filament Friday, and I got some great advice on upgrades for the machine that you can actually print 
on the stock machine. So definitely give that a check out too. Now, any questions you guys might have, I will try to answer as I go along. And we're going to get into, as I mentioned, printing off some stuff and having a go at painting it so that you can see just a way broader range of things that you can do with these machines at home. So anything that you want to know, pop it in the old box below. Uh, if I know the answer already, I'll try and answer directly, or it might come up in a future video. And as always, guys, thank you very much for your time and you enjoy the rest of your day.